Hello, everybody. I'm Jeff Nathanson, Executive Director of the Museum of Sonoma County. Welcome to Conversations with Artists. We're so pleased you could join us today. I'm thrilled that we have Pat Lenz, uh, an artist from Healdsburg, uh, just north of where we're located in Santa Rosa, who is um, a, an artist exhibiting work in our current exhibition, 35. 35 artists for 35 years. Uh, the exhibition is highlights from our, our permanent collection and we've selected 35 artists who represent a broad range of styles, topical uh, subject matter, uh, media, and uh, we have a, a collection that really started in 1984, the year before the museum was open to the public. And uh, we're we're sitting. I'm sitting here in our um, well virtual background uh, in our main gallery. And uh, over my shoulder is um, nobody's poodle, a wonderful piece by the artist Pat Lenz. And Pat, thank you for joining uh, me today in order to talk about your work and have a conversation about art and other important matters. Well, good morning, and it's my pleasure to be with you, Jeff. And um, I'm always happy to talk about my work. Well, I shouldn't say that. I'm really not comfortable that, talking about my work. I like people to see it for themselves and make their own judgments. But um, Nobody's Poodle was, it was one of the more exciting pieces for me to do and to exhibit. And I was thrilled when the museum acquired one. It's an edition of three. And um, if you'd like, I can swing over to my website now and give well, you um you know, uh, that's a great idea. Why don't we just go right to the work? Uh, so if you share your screen, we can look at your website and uh, let's talk about Nobody's Poodle, uh, uh, feminist art and um, all other things that you touch on in your work. You have such a, a, a broad range of work. Uh, and while you're um, getting to your website, um, I just wanna mention that I, I know from your uh, biography that you are originally from Brooklyn. And I, I, I do hope you'll share with us a little bit about what journey took you from Brooklyn to Sonoma County. Um, I, <laughs> I just moved out. I, I, I'm a California native myself, but I was in Princeton, New Jersey for about 18 years and then came to Santa Rosa. And uh, I know the East Coast, West Coast thing can be um, a, a big change, a culture shock. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, well, I'll share my screen. And, okay. Great, that worked. Well, this is the um, second time the museum showed the poodle. The first time was over in the post office building. But a little bit about my history. Yes, I was born in Brooklyn. And uh, in those days, it was most people's ambitions to get into Manhattan, which is what my parents did when I was still very young. Uh, today's everybody's ambition is to get out of Manhattan and move into Brooklyn. So it's, it's been a reverse migration. Um, I was, I think, very fortunate to grow up in New York City. I think New York City kids have a certain sense, at least I did growing up, of being able to get around in the world very easily. Uh, in those days, which was really in the 50s, uh, Parents weren't as concerned about children traveling alone. I was on the subway going wherever I wanted to. There was a great sense of uh, freedom and ability to just find the culture you wanted to. I, I used to walk home every day from the subway to my house and stop off at the Frick Museum. It was free, I could wander in there and just look at what I wanted to look at. So I grew up very early surrounded with the museums of New York City. And, um, I had a father who was, he was a doctor, he was a neurosurgeon, but he himself loved to paint. And so he took me to museums as a little girl. And I remember seeing a Van Gogh show that just blew me away. I couldn't believe the thickness of the paint on those cypress trees. So um, I started off sculpting. That was my major in art. I went to Sarah Lawrence College and then went on to get a degree, further degree at Columbia. And then I taught art for a number of years and I always maintained a studio. My initial sculpture was in steel. That was the uh, welded steel sculpture was what Sarah Lawrence taught. It, the department was started by David Smith, 
and that was his milieu. And so then that's what we continued in. But I segued from that into some stone and some plaster, but eventually wound up doing, wound up doing uh, fiberglass. For whatever reason, I wanted the ability to mold more in the round, and I just found the medium connected. I connected with the medium. So here is the poodle in the museum's window. And um, I also did some smaller poodles, which are installed here at the slaughterhouse. And uh, basically the, the idea of the poodle came when somebody called Tony Blair, I think George Bush's poodle, and I thought nobody should be anybody else's poodle. And I have been a feminist, a very proud feminist my entire life. Uh, the idea of the power of women though is um, a different power for men. In fact, I think the quote that I used here, uh, women are responsible for the survival of the world, men are responsible for its glories. I mean, I know people will take exception with that, but growing up in New York and seeing the bridges and the skyscrapers that were built by men, I have great appreciation for the capabilities of men. But then also living through the end of World War II and Korean War and wars we've had forever. Men have a more, um, they have testosterone and they have that, I don't know, desire to conquer, which women don't have. We're the gatherers, they're the hunters. Uh, so I appreciate men, but I really think the more women are empowered, the safer and healthier the world will be. Um, the, uh, Pat, you know, I, I really appreciate that and I, I have to agree with you, but before we move on too far, mm -hmm. I just, for people who haven't seen uh, the poodle in person and or haven't had a chance to explore it, would you maybe talk about some of the components of this amazing piece? And um, certainly, yeah. I just I really want people to understand what the, what you've made and what they're looking at. Okay, um, she's about nine feet tall, eight feet wide, an addition of three. Um, she's done in epoxy resin with an automotive paint. And she is basically, her tail is a hand grenade. It just came to me one day, I don't know why. But the hand grenade is not a weapon of destruction, it's her perfume atomizer. Because perfume, first of all, perfume to me is scent is very important. I've been in two careers that involve being good at smelling things. I was a chef and I was a vineyard and winemaker. So um, this is her perfume atomizer. And I researched what scent means for women. And it's actually, each of us has our own individual personal scent, just like a fingerprint. And for women, when they actually have the desire to get pregnant, they look for men who scent pheromones, which actually exhibit their immune system, believe it or not. So they're looking for complementary immune system, opposite immune system. So whatever offspring they have has more immunity. And I thought that was just absolutely fascinating. So again, it, it ties in with all of what I believe about women. And um, I'm a very peace loving person. I don't believe in, in war. I really don't. And uh, so I put together this piece of sculpture and with it, I did a video and I worked with a, an artist named Liz Magic Laser. She helped me with it. And again, that's about the sounds that, um, it sounds of words that women are called derogatorily. There are so many word, nasty ways of calling a woman, well, just, swearing at a woman really. And so this is just a very guttural interpretation of that. And it was done by a voiceover artist. And then I also did a perfume. I worked with the perfume room in Brooklyn. We created a scent. And I think I had a little something about that. Yeah. And it has five elements and the elements, here it is, represent the milk of human kindness, 
the Rose of Peace, Sea of Tranquility, Mother Earth, and Mother Nature. And let me see. I, I would say that was it. The piece took me quite a while. Um, I worked with a mold maker and another friend of mine, Dottie Rickelson, helped me enormously with it. And uh, Jose Villagomez, who works for me, also helped. So I wasn't totally alone in, in doing it because it was a very laborious project. Uh, I'm just curious, Pat, about um, yeah. how it was made structurally. Um, it, 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 um, it, yeah, I yeah, like what, how, how did you, um, what kind of frame framework is in the interior? Mm -hmm. You know, it's such a large, um, imposing kind of piece of sculpture. I think a number of artists who work in fiberglass uh, very often do a clay maquette, a clay model. I mean, the real thing in clay and cover it. We'll make a mold and then inject fiberglass into it. I don't work that way. I start off making an original piece, a finished piece. Um, and then see if I want to make a mold. What I do is start with uh, very, very large blocks of styrofoam. And then I start carving with uh, sawzalls or whatever rasps or wire brushes that I, I find comfortable working with. Actually, a dog's wire brush is what I use a lot. It was really a wonderful tool for this. So then I get the form as smooth and as close to perfect as I can be in styrofoam and then I cover it with epoxy resin and that's um, once that's done I start a fairing process it's if you were working with um, polyester resins which I don't you would be it would be you would be using bondo to what we call fair it smooth it but I make my own in, in an epoxy resin epoxy is more durable they use it in marine constructions and, and surfboards and things like that. So then I get it completely smooth and imperfection free, I hope. And um, then I take it to an automotive painter. And that is that. <laughs> the, um, I forget who actually fabricated the handle and the trigger for the um, grenade. I don't remember who did that. It was someone in Santa Rosa who worked with that. Well, it's, it's interesting you said that you yeah. have um, it painted uh, as, as uh, a car would be painted, you know, automotive mm -hmm. paint job. Mm -hmm. And um, I just have to say that one of the remarkable things to me about this, this piece is that it, it looks like it rolled off a Detroit assembly line. It right. really <laughs> looks like it is manufactured at a very high standard of, wow. of, of you know, engineering and, and sort of um, Thank you. You know, automotive Thank production um, uh, through that process. And, and so I, the first time I saw it in person, I, I was just really blown away at how beautifully made it is. Thank you. It was one of the difficult decisions was the color pink. I mean, I, it definitely had to be a pink poodle, but you know, the range of colors of pink. And um, it took a lot of work and tests until I got this pink, which I really love. Well, it, it, it's definitely, um, <laughs> it, yeah. it's a very, it, it's a dramatic kind of a whimsical, um, but loaded with meaning kind of uh, piece that so. um, it, it really commands the space. Uh, it, Thank you. So yeah. congratulations on making Thank the, the work. Thank you very much. So you, um, you mentioned Slaughterhouse. Um, I just want yeah. to go back to that, uh, mm -hmm. uh, that reference. So um, Slaughterhouse space is a, a space that you have in Healdsburg. Um, tell us yes. about that space and, and what you're doing there. Well, when I moved to Healdsburg from the Napa Valley, we, we actually, my husband and I were on Long Island. We had one of the first wineries on Long Island and we moved from there to the Napa Valley. And then from the Napa Valley, we moved to Healdsburg and in the process, we were looking for commercial spaces because we built a small hotel downtown in Healdsburg. And uh, the broker showed us this active slaughterhouse for sale. And it was the middle of the winter 
it was the dreariest, muddiest place, sad as could be. I, I'm a vegetarian, so it's ironic. There were um, cows in the, what they call the anti-mortem, the stockades in the front. And it was just all in all a miserable looking space, but it had this huge building on the property and another little house. And I said, I wanted to see it, but I don't want to see it when it's working. I don't want to see, go into an active slaughterhouse. So the broker brought us back. My husband wouldn't get out of the car. I went in the building, took one look and said, perfect. This would make the most divine studio space, et cetera. And I wanted to live in it right away because I could see it as a great wall, like Tribeca wide wall. But anyway, we bought it and we moved into the little house and I had all of this wonderful space that had artifacts from its previous uh, business. And it had incredible light. Um, Paul McCartney said if slaughterhouses had windows, everyone would be a vegetarian. But this had windows just very high up. And with all of its concrete, I thought this is just a great place to have shows. And so I started doing exhibits, working either by myself as a curator or with other people um, to put on exhibits and performances of things that you wouldn't normally expect to see in wine country. And I did that for about seven years, six or seven years. It was open to the public, it was free, um, and it was a lot of fun. I met wonderful artists. Uh, I worked with a curator named Hannah Regev, who did a show on Duchamp and his influence of Bay Area artists. Uh, that was a, just a wonderful show, very intelligent show with incredible work. Um, but after a while, I, it's not that easy doing that kind of thing. And it, I, I thought it's time to convert the space into a living space. So that's what I have now. We really are living in the slaughterhouse space. And I'm not doing shows anymore. I did one last show in what was my studio, which I cleaned up. I'm no longer working in fiberglass. I thought enough is enough. I'm of an age where it was a lot of physical work and I wanted to do something that was less environmentally invasive. And certainly fiberglass is not a pleasant medium to work in. So now I'm working digitally. And Very interesting. Else. Well, I'd, I'd love for you to uh, take us through some of the work you've done um, since, uh, since you transitioned from fiberglass and also if you have other fiberglass works. Um, sure. Uh, just okay. let's look at a, a, a little bit more of your body of work. Okay, I can show you some of the, the sculptures that I did in the at the same time that I did uh, the poodle. Uh, it was part of a show of it. It was it was a very sad time, really. It was a time where I felt that um, women weren't being heard. Basically, that was it, and. I, and, I and what, what years are, are you talking about? I'm trying to remember it. <laughs> well, I know, I know that um, uh, Nobody's Poodle was exhibited um, at our museum and, and acquired for the collection in 2011. Right. So this was probably about 29. I would say about that, 2010. Mm -hmm. Around that time, I was doing a body of work that included the poodle. It included... Um, this piece, oh, I don't think these enlarge. Oh, I'm so sorry, I thought they would. Um, this, this piece here is inspired from the movie A Clockwork Orange. And in the movie, he, this is, it's a small piece of sculpture on this woman's, she's the cat lady, on a, a side table she has. And he picks it up and he actually kills her with it. And I just thought that the idea of a piece of sculpture being used as a weapon was shocking to me. And I've exhibited this a number of times with the video of the murder scene projected onto it, and it's very effective. Then I did this tongue because I think so many, because words hurt. And I don't know of very many sculptures of a tongue, but it was an interesting piece to work on. Uh, the only other thing I know of that's of a well-known tongue is um, oh, the Rolling Stones, basically. Hmm. But anyway, so that's also a fairly large size piece. And then I did this, which is a, a broken heart. 
And hearts, when they break, uh, it, there is a syndrome called the broken heart syndrome, very often with women, more so than men. And the heart constricts and takes the shape of what the Japanese call a squid trap. But um, I thought of it more as uh, the Venus of Willendorf, which basically, this isn't the best photograph, this looks like. So that was this large photograph of that. When I moved into the slaughterhouse, I was enthralled with, well, I was interested in Duchamp. I have a very love-hate relationship with him. But anyway, I, I thought I've got to get him out of my system. So I sculpted this quite large head. You can go in it. And um, it's called The Thought That Counts. And once you get inside it is uh, Courbet, Gustave Courbet's. It's a, a photo, what do you call it? It's, it's got a light behind it. It's like a light box of his origin of the um, universe. And so that's inside that head. This is a piece I did many, many years ago um, for the Napa Valley Wine Auction. And, uh, and I did a mold of it and, and did, an, I think, an addition of five. This is a I'm series. Sorry, um, which, which piece were you pointing to? Oh, this oh, one. Oh, oh the yeah. reclining this, figure. OK, great. This, figure. this piece here, the apple, it was um, the very first piece I did in fiberglass. And that's about eight feet wide. It's, it's a good size piece. It's a lot of fun. It's a very art piece. and. Um, I, again, was inspired by kind of the feminine figure while I was working on this. As I was sculpting it, it, it was very much like a buttocks to me. And so I titled it after Duchamp, She Has a Hot Ass. <laughs> so oh, that's the title of that. Um, and I, that was an edition of four. And then this is a piece, the only piece I've done in stone. Uh, I did it. Oh my gosh, in the 80s, in the mid 80s, uh, when I had horses and I had a horse that had injured itself and was skull bound. And so I sculpted its head and it was um, limestone that I got from the Cathedral of St. John the Divine, which uh, they were selling pieces of limestone to sculptors. So it was really lovely working with that. So this is just a short overview of my sculpture. I've done much more, but that was, those are a few pieces. I've done some collaborative work. Uh, I was part of the 428 Collective in Healdsburg. And that was just a wonderful, we still are friends. We don't work together anymore, but we um, were great support for each other. Most of us were working outside of the normal realms of wine country art. We had video artists and photographers and conceptual artists and it was just wonderful working with these women. I, we had a wonderful time showing together and uh, reading together with the book clubs. It, it just made life in, in a more rural area a lot more fun. So this was one of the videos I did for it. Let's see. Then we did a CSA that we sold and we, we did it almost like, you know, farmers do their vegetable products and we put that together. And so for one of them, I did a series of three different videos. One was on the one black man in Healdsburg whom I interviewed. One was on the sculpture Golden Boy, which is now in Texas, which had a very interesting kind of renovation. And then one on fresh pickles and sticky buns because sticky buns were what drew me to Healdsburg in the downtown bakery. Uh, um, and Pat, for yeah. our viewers, viewers who um, don't know what a CSA is, um, why don't you? Oh, you know, I'm not sure exactly. It's a, it's a collect. What is it? It's. Um, oh, I'm trying to. Remember. You know, I don't even know myself exactly what it stands for. But it's. Yeah, I, it's I actually um, I'm blanking too. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's basically you buy um, a box of vegetables. That come it's to you like a, it's almost like a collector's uh, um, right. co-op. It's, it's, it's yeah, like a it's, way to buy art through kind of a co-op. Um, well, it's more with vegetables, really, with farmers. They put together uh, an assortment of their produce for you and deliver it once a week, usually. I think right. that's and, it. And so <laughs> your, your group was um, putting together basically um, 
a package of right. works that people exactly. could subscribe to. Exactly, that was it. Uh -huh. Yeah, I, I, I think it, it, it mean I think the CSA stands for something like collector's subscription something, I don't know. Um, I, don't, I, rem I remember uh, it was the, the, that was a pretty popular way for yes. people to affordably collect art. Oh, um, I didn't realize that. Yeah. Oh, actually, uh, John is uh, informing us. Um, and uh, oh, I'll just give a shout out to uh, John Del Buono on our, okay. um, uh, our staff, who's our, our tech support today, and also our um, exhibition and, and uh, program manager. Um, but um, it's, um, you know, it's uh, uh, little community supported agriculture. I'll just um, hey, put on the chat so people yeah. can see that. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that's great. Thank you, John. Um, Glad, Thank glad you. you looked that up while we're, you know, <laughs> speculating on what it actually meant. Um, well, um, th this is really interesting. And uh, what what are your most recent works? Um, I think that would be okay. really interesting to. to uh, okay, I do want to make just make a note that I have been collaborating with uh, a friend of mine. Her name is uh, Zuska Kurtz, and we've been collaborating for many, many years on Instagram. And we post every day and we pick a subject. And uh, our latest one will, our latest one is I've got the 2021 jitters. So if anyone's on Instagram, they can look that up. But we've been doing it for years and it's been an amazing creative experience. Uh, let's see. Okay, my latest works, I've been working in photography and uh, I've been doing. Well, this was a series of collages that I did. This is called Vanishing Matriarchies. And let me see. So those can go larger. And I'll just run through them. And I was inspired by different photographers for each one. Annie Leibowitz, Penn. No, that was Avedon, and this is Penn. Okay. And how long have you been working on this series of uh, digital artworks? Off oh, for about three years now. Great. And this is um, Say Goodbye from Lars von Trier's uh, apocalyptic movie. Oh, Melancholia, which is was one of my favorite movies. I, I think I was at a point, uh, along with a lot of other pe people, feeling like we were coming into an apocalyptic age. And I was in New York, and I saw this young woman with her baby and took the photograph of her, and then I worked with scenes from the uh, movie. I did that. Wow. Yeah. That, that's, that's really powerful. And let's see. back. And then uh, this is a piece, a series that I liked a lot. Again, it's a, a, a dark theme. It was from a poem by Byron called Darkness. And so there we go. And this is the poem in the upper space with the side Twombly behind it. And then I have an apocalyptic scene here, a horse in the middle, and then something to do with the galaxies, the the universe. So I did that. So was the Cy Twombly um, choice because of the patterning that? Um, yes, and, and also or is there some other meaning? No, basically, I, uh, he's an, an artist whose work I really love, and I, I like the abstraction of his work. I love the rhythm of his work, and uh, he works in a way that's so different from me. I admire him enormously. You know, he's much more uh, free and loose. I'm much more conceptual and I don't know. Yeah, I love, love Cy yeah. Twombly's work, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, very and interesting. Had, you know, and this is on a more um, upbeat note, let's say. <laughs> well, I'm not very upbeat about the world at the moment. And this is a series I did on technology. This was actually the first I did. And I thought this was interesting. New technology is not good or evil. 
in and of itself. It's all about how people choose to use it. I'm a big Apple fan, so I don't think they're the monsters that uh, some of the other platforms are. And I've worked with this model before, and so she's in each and every one. And, and I see and there's it, an Amazon uh, reference there. Oh yeah, this is this is Amazon, and this is their um, the slogan for each of them: work hard, have fun, make history. Mm -hmm. And then uh, this is Apple. Think different. I have Steve Jobs in there, and this is Facebook, which I'm not a big fan of. And don't be evil. It's Google. Defend and respect the user's voice, which is Twitter. And that was actually the very first piece I did. Interesting. Yeah, great, great. It's so nice to see that work. Um, for our viewers um, who want to explore your work more, um, just want to mention, uh, you can see it um, at, uh, in, in, uh, at the top of the screen there, but it's patlens.com. So that's right. how you can get to right. your website. Mm -hmm. And these are just some, some of the photographs I've been working on. Uh, I've been actually working with um, Caitlin McCaffrey. I don't know if you know her work. She's a wonderful, well, she's a wonderful photographer and she's an amazing teacher. And she and I have been working together because I really was not that great with a single lens reflex. I didn't know photography. I did video quite a bit and I do editing and I love the computer. But she's got me really very proficient, much more proficient with photography. She's been fabulous. So I've been working on that. And that's what I'm continuing to do. Fantastic. Yep. Thank you. Yeah, well, thank you for uh, sharing all of those images and, and uh, talking so much about your work, um, past and, and present. Uh, so um, I'm going to go back to nobody's poodle for a, a moment, just because that's uh, what we have in the show, and um, um, you can see it uh, right over my shoulder there. Um, so in 2011, um, uh, Satri Penchak, who is a, a local curator and um, art writer, uh, actually mm -hmm. serves on our uh, exhibition advisory committee. Um, she um, she wrote. Um, in her article about your work, uh, she really talked about uh, Judy Chicago, uh, the history of feminist art, put um, your work and, and in particular Nobody's Poodle into um, sort of feminist art historical context. And you, you made um, a few mentions in describing your work about, um, about feminism and uh, and, and women in power. And I'm just really interested in how you see the state of affairs for feminism and, and feminist artists. And uh, so, much, so much has changed, especially recently, but uh, you know, over the decades, um, the, the feminist movement uh, really started to take shape in the 1970s. And there's, there's been, uh, fits and starts, and it's been kind of a, a, an interesting journey from then to, to now. But um, just, I'd love to hear your thoughts on, on the current state of affairs and where do you think we're going? Well, I, I think that uh, women are more and more appreciated and shown and exhibited. I, and I think that the prices they're getting have come up. I'm maybe not on a par with men, but I think soon they will be. Uh, just for example, three of the shows that I really, really want to see in New York are Alice Neal, um, Nikki de saint and Yo-Yo Kusama. You know, and one is at one PS1, one is at the Met, and the other is at the Brooklyn uh, Botanical Gardens. And those are the three most exciting shows for me right now in New York. Uh, I think particularly women of color, their work is extremely strong right now. They have a lot to say. They, they really do, and they're saying it beautifully. And uh, I admire so many of them, I really do. Uh, Amy, Amy Sherald's work, I think is very, very strong and uh, quite beautiful. I wish I could see the show that is in, I think Kentucky now, that 
she's going to have her piece of uh, Brianna Taylor. I think she's showing that one that she did. Oh, oh, I don't know, Julie Murray too. I don't, women, I think when I was starting my first business in the seventies, it was impossible as a woman to start a business on your own. You needed your husband to sign a lease. It, you really could barely get a credit card. I don't even know if we had credit cards back then, but it really was a man's world. And I had to fight a tooth and nail and I did. I, I really, I was lucky. I was raised with parents who believed I could do anything, just go ahead and do it, you know? And I, I did, I was not afraid to do that. I, you know, I think that that's so important. Um, I just want to just um, talk about that uh, subject for just a moment. My, so my parents um, are are both alive, thank goodness, and uh, but quite elderly. But it, it's it's interesting. In the past few years, I started um, helping my parents to um, manage their affairs, and my mother, who has a long long career as um, as an attorney and um, as an educator and an attorney and was um, a very active with the League of Women Voters and multiple times as her chapter um, president in, in Los Angeles County um, and really a feminist from way back. Mm -hmm. So I was really surprised and I think she was quite uh, disturbed to find there were there were um, the the deed to my parents' house and and um, uh, most of their uh, bank accounts and and mm -hmm. all the credit cards everything had my father's name on it and as his uh, he has Alzheimer's so as his ability to um, really manage the family affairs declined my mother was trying to take care of his. You, the, the hoops we've had to jump through because right. the system was basically biased against women. Very and so. and my, my, decades, my mother has been a signer on the credit cards and on the checking mm -hmm. account. And it was just incredibly difficult. And it, it shows you that even today, those antiquated notions about yes. the man being in charge mm -hmm. um, we're, we're not through it. it it's not oh, yes. over yet. We're not done. It's infuriating. I just joined some organization and I put my husband down. All the mail now comes with his name on it. So it's, it doesn't end. It really doesn't end. No. But well, um, we're making progress little by oh, little, yes. right? We are. We are making progress. And I think the more women's voices that are heard and the more women in power we have, the more women we have in politics, the better we'll be. I really do think so. I, I think it's making the world much better. Although I think the world is in a horrible place right now. <laughs> I'm very, de not depressed, but I'm very pessimistic about the future of what we're going to have on this planet. Well, artists have a, a platform and there is a role that artists play in addressing the ills in society and the problems that our world faces. Um, how, how do you see your role and what, I guess, what advances um, do you see happening and um, where, where do the frustrations lie for you? Well, the frustrations lie, first of all, I was, I lived through a number of really earth shattering events when I think about it, Hiroshima, really, first of all, um, then the assassination of JFK. These are milestones in my life. The um, fall of the World Trade Center and then the rise of Trump and now COVID. So those are five, you know, just sea changes for the world. It was, uh, actually it was the nuclear bomb that convinced me not to have children. It really was. I, I decided if that's the world I'm going to live in, I don't think I want to bring anybody else into that world. And so I didn't I specifically, I was very clear about that at a very young age. I'm not sure that art saves lives. I really don't know if it, it may save individual lives, but I'm not sure it's going to be able to save this planet. I think it, it can tell the story. I think it can show things in a way that you don't, you would not think of it normally. Art has a wonderful way of 
coming at things from every single angle. I think as an artist, one of the things I was always trained to do is never say never, always look at every, every facet of things, and particularly being a sculptor where you walk around your sculpture and you want to see it from every single angle. But I think that's the way artists bring something very special to the plate. And that very well, most often, more, most of the artists I know are open-minded, willing to accept or look at and be interested in almost anything. Let's take the NFTs right now. I mean, most people think, oh my God, when I first heard of an NFT, I was fascinated with it. Not that I believe it's a great thing, I, but I, I wasn't one to say, oh, this is ridiculous. I would never do it. I started to investigate it because I thought it was just kind of an interesting thing, you know? So I do think artists are um, unique in their perspective about the world and their way of showing it. They may be able to make people sit up and say, oh my God, I never thought of it that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I'm glad you framed it in, in that manner because um, I don't think a museum like ours or um, galleries would um, would uh, continue to exist or, or have any uh, value in society if it weren't for the content that's being produced by artists. And um, mm -hmm. I see our role as helping to uh, communicate to the public and, and opening people's eyes and, and providing yes. different perspectives on a whole range of, of topics. And, um, and, and most people aren't, you know, they, they're not trained to be observant. They're not um, given the opportunity or they don't take the opportunity to really think more deeply or have a, a more broad-minded view of things because people are just so immersed in their own personal lives and the challenges and, and mm -hmm. so much that is weighing on us as human beings in this really difficult world that we, in which we live. Um, more mm -hmm. locally, I just wonder, um, about the impact of wildfires, because on top of everything you've mentioned, we have um, sort of an environmental crisis that is really close to home, uh, of course, connected to the planet and climate change, but um, have you been impacted in any particular way by the wildfires where, where you're- Well, very much so. I mean, of course, living in Hillsburg, unfortunately, our property seems, I don't even want to put a jinx on it. It's, um, we don't have a lot of burnable material around us, we have vineyard and we have a lot of DG. It's a concrete building and metal roof. But what I found fascinating was the other day I said, oh, I know what I'm going to do. We have a swimming pool. I'm going to get wetsuits for my husband and me. And in the fire, we'll just jump in the swimming pool. And then I thought, this is insane. <laughs> that this is what I'm thinking of doing, that I'm going to go and buy a wetsuit. This is how, I mean, this is the new normal in my life. I thought this is really crazy, you know? Yeah, I... It, it, it is crazy when we think about what we have to do and how we have to think differently about um, the way we live our lives. And, and now, of course, um, I guess we're about 14 months into the pandemic and um, all of the, the changes that we've had to um, endure, really. It's, it's yeah, really exactly. been a, a difficult time. So um, I think as we wrap this up, um, any thoughts about what maybe you were able to um, learn or accomplish or, or get out of the pandemic that might be something that you can take with you and share with um, the community as we move forward? Yes, I can. I mean, I think like a lot of people I knew, no, first of all, I'm very fortunate to be in the situation I'm in, in the town that I'm in, living on the property I am. I mean, I have access to nature. We had a small bubble of very, very close friends that we saw throughout the whole thing. So my husband is suffering from memory loss. So uh, it was a very interesting time to be with him and appreciate having him and the company and the sense of humor and just the sweetness. Uh, I tried to not get myself 
down. I would not watch bad movies, sad movies, horror movies, depressing movies. I started working on a book of photographs of my dog and it's called Leo's Lockdown Lexicon. And it's every letter of the alphabet relating to the COVID lockdown. And it's very funny and I had a blast doing it. <laughs> and uh, I just wanna keep my sense of humor alive. I wanna keep positive and happy. And there's so much out there that's trying, that just makes it really difficult. So I'm grateful to my friends. I'm grateful to my art because I'm happiest when I'm doing it. I'm out of the world. I'm really, you know, in another world. And um, I'm just happy to be in Sonoma County. I'm, fires or no fires, I feel very fortunate to have been here during COVID. Yeah. Well, thank you, Pat. Well, we're grateful to you. We're happy that you um, have joined uh, me for this conversation today. We are so thrilled to have your artwork, um, uh, Nobody's Poodle, in our permanent collection. Uh, which I'll, I'll mention to our viewers who aren't that familiar with our museum, that um, we are a, a Smithsonian affiliate museum. We have uh, a collection of over 18,000 objects and artworks. Uh, some of them are very small, some of them are very old, some of them are more recent and quite large, like uh, Pat's work um, and everything in between. The museum is currently open on weekends um, in our contemporary art gallery is open on weekends and we are um, planning to open the um, entire campus. That's our uh, historic post office building, our sculpture garden, as well as our contemporary galleries May 1st. And hopefully as we progress through the year, um, we'll continue to open additional days and hours and um, we're just looking forward to having the public come back, see uh, these exhibitions in person. And I invite everybody to go to our website, museumsc.org. And also please check out Pat Lenz website, patlenz.com. Um, on behalf of everybody at the Museum of Sonoma County, thank you, Pat, for joining us today. And thank you to everybody who's tuned in. I'm Jeff Nathanson. So long.